Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and today I want to share with you about how to become a water walker. And of course, this is taken from Matthew chapter 14, about where Jesus called Peter, and uh, Peter walked on the water to Jesus. And there are some great lessons to learn out of this. Actually, uh, what I'm doing on this tape is just taking a number of different things that the Lord has shown me over 34 years worth of seeking him, little truths about faith and kind of putting them all together into one teaching. Actually, this morning, as I was studying the word, I just read this passage of scripture and uh, it's not new revelation, but it's a new way of presenting it, kind of bringing a bunch of things together. And it just has uh, excited me. I have spent most of the day just writing things in my own personal diary that the Lord has been showing me. And again, it's not new revelation. It's just a new way of expressing some things, different points, which I believe makes some things clearer. So on this tape, I just decided to sit down and make this tape to encourage you. I tell you, every one of us have situations in our life that look like they're about to kill us. And we need a miracle from God. Now, if you don't have a situation like that, Either you are in a lull, and there is coming a time that you will need a supernatural uh, miracle from God, or you simply aren't doing anything. I tell you, we need to be believing for things that are bigger than ourselves. we got a supernatural God, and if we really get make ourselves available, God will lead you to do things that are beyond your own natural physical ability. And so with most people, if you are really seeking God, I believe that there should be something that, you know, you are stretching for, something that you're believing God for. And in a very real sense, that's where Peter and all of these disciples were. They were in a situation where it looked like they were about to die and they needed a miracle. Peter actually got out of the boat, walked on the water, and yet we know that it wasn't everything that God intended it to be. He did a miracle. He did something that no other person in um, the history of the Bible or any other type of recorded history has ever done outside of Jesus. And yet he fell short of the goal. And there's lessons to learn about how he first walked on water. There's lessons to learn about what we can do to maintain once we do step out of the boat and begin to believe God. And there's some things here that I think could radically change the way that you receive from God. On this tape, I'm going to be talking about some things that are very simple and I believe basic Christianity, and yet it's not understood. And that's precisely one of the reasons that there are so few people that are out of the boat and trusting God for a miracle. Most people are in the boat looking for the security there. Even though that they're going down, they've got company. And they've got everybody else sinking at the same rate. And so they console themselves thinking, well, you know, everybody's in this same boat. But I tell you, you don't have to settle for what the world's doing. God can call us to a higher standard and we can see greater things happen. In the 14th chapter of the book of Mark, we find the instance where Jesus fed the 5,000 men. That's men only. That's not including the women and children that were present. There was at least 10,000, maybe 15, 20,000 people. And he fed them with five loaves and two fish. And then at um, the end of that miracle in verse 22, this is Matthew 14:22, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the even was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, before we go any further about all this, let me just say some things. This this same instance is recorded in all four of the Gospels. It's one of the very few things that all four of the gospel writers recorded alike. And in Mark chapter 6, it gives this same instance. And in Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 45, it says, In straight way he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go uh, 
and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. And notice it says that he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go unto the other side. It says the same thing right here in Matthew chapter 14. My point is that this is consistent in each one of these situations. He did not tell his disciples to get into the boat, go halfway across the lake and drown. Now, this is important. I'm going to be going through just a number of different things here. And sometimes people say, well, let's just get to the part where, you know, Peter walked on the water. Tell me how I can receive a miracle in my life. But all of these things are interrelated. You've got to recognize that the Lord doesn't say things that aren't significant. If the Lord has ever spoken a word to you, he meant every single word, every jot, every tittle, every punctuation mark. The Lord doesn't waste breath. He doesn't say things idly. When he says something, there is a purpose to it. And he told the people to get into the boat and go to the other side. He did not say get into the boat and drown halfway across. See, if they would have just thought about the power of his word. This was God the Father. It says in John chapter 1 that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And it goes on to say that Jesus was that word. Jesus is God and Jesus is the one. It says in Colossians chapter 1 that all things were created by him and without him was not anything made that was made. God spoke everything into existence. He did it through Jesus. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, that all of this world is held up or held together by the integrity of his word. By him all things consist, is what it says in Hebrews 1, 3. So my point is, this is the creator God who created everything physical, even that very sea, the wind, the waves, the storm, everything that they were encountering was created by Jesus. And Jesus is that parent force. And the parent force said, go to the other side. If they would have really recognized who they were dealing with, if they, I'm I'm sure that they knew it. At one time, Peter said, you know, you are the Christ. Actually, that's a couple of chapters later, but I believe that he already had that revelation by this time. They knew who Jesus was, but they weren't keeping it foremost in their thoughts. Uh, They allowed themselves to become preoccupied. As a matter of fact, over in uh, Mark chapter 6, it says, I believe in verse 52, that the reason they were shocked and amazed to see Jesus was because their heart was hardened. They didn't consider the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. If they would have really thought about who this was, this man just took five loaves of bread, two fish, fed at least 10,000, maybe 20,000 people and had more left over when he got through than he did when he started. If they would have been focused on that and thinking about that, did you know that they could have taken the faith, the authority, the power, the absolute control over the physical, natural realm that they had seen Jesus just exert in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And because of that, they could have just stood there and said, he did not tell us to drown halfway across. They could have walked on the water to the other side. They could have commanded the wind and the storm to cease as Jesus did in Mark chapter 4. That instance had already taken place. They had already seen Jesus calm the storm. And if nothing else, they could have drawn on that same ability and have calmed the storm. They could have done something, but instead they allowed circumstances, what they were seeing in the natural realm, to overwhelm them. And I know that a lot of people would would just identify 100% with them and say, well, now, wait a minute, this was a severe storm. You know, the Sea of Galilee is only like four miles across. I've been there. I've been on a boat. It was actually a tourist boat, but it was called the Jesus boat. I thought that was really neat. And we got out on the Sea of Galilee, and I just sat there and taught about this very instance. And I talked about what happened on the Sea of Galilee. It was it was a great experience, but it's not a big sea is what I'm saying. And it was only like four miles across. And for them to have gotten into the boat at even, which means somewhere around sunset, could have been 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, depending on what time of the year it was. And yet here it was in the third watch, which means it's somewhere 
between the time of 2 and, and uh, probably 4 a.m., somewhere around there. So in somewhere around six to eight hours, they had only covered two miles. They were in a severe storm, and because of that, most people would just say, man, you can't fault them. Look at how bad it was. But again, that's because we magnify physical, natural things. I'm saying, and the Lord, you'll see when the Lord speaks to them here, he didn't compliment them or say, guys, I'm sorry, it's my fault. I shouldn't have left you out on the sea by yourself. I'm responsible. I should have been here. I should have done something. No, that's not the Lord's response. Instead, he said something about their little faith and talked to them about, why are you fearful? What's wrong with you guys? In other words, they should have related more to the spiritual realm than they did the physical realm. And those people who would identify and say, well, man, I understand exactly how they feel. And boy, it's hard to maintain your faith when you're in the midst of a storm. Well, the Lord understands he has compassion on us. God is a compassionate God. But I tell you what, that is not normal. It may be normal according to those who don't believe God, but it is not the normal Christian life. If we would focus on what God has done, recognize who it is that we serve, recognize his command that he's given us, that he didn't call you to be a failure. He didn't call you to lose this battle. He didn't call you to die of sickness. He didn't call you to be be poor so that you could not fulfill his will. He didn't call you to do those things. God made you to be a world overcomer. And if you could get hold of that and begin to start meditating on the promises and the things that he's spoken unto you, your faith would rise. And instead of being overcome by your problems, you could overcome your problems by the promises of God. Anyway, this is all preliminary, but it's all here. He spoke to them and he didn't tell them to go part way. And then if. There's absolute calm they might make it. But if a storm comes up, you guys have had it. No, he told them to go to the other side. They had a word from Creator God. And if they would have put absolute faith in that, they could have stood in the face of that storm and have defied it. They could have walked on the water as Jesus and Peter proved. In John chapter 6, this exact same instance is recorded. And in John's gospel, he's the only one who made this clear, but when Jesus came back into the boat with Peter, it said that immediately the boat was at the shore whether they went. In other words, it was just translated two miles to the other side. Did you know that was possible? I don't know for sure that Jesus was the one that was intended to make all of this happen. He gave the disciples a command to go to the other side. And it's very possible that if they would have stood and believed, maybe that would have happened for them. But the point is that God, if he's commanded you to do something, everything in creation has to bow its knee to what God says. He is creator God. And if we would get that attitude, if the disciples would have had this attitude, there would have been a totally different experience here. So in verse 24, it says, And the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And, of course, the symbolism here. I'm not just talking about a historical fact. I'm trying to apply this to our physical life. And, you know, the symbolism, the application to our life is that, man, God has told us to do things that goes against the normal flow of nature. The wind is contrary to us. People are contrary to us. Uh, there may be things that God has laid on your heart that just look absolutely impossible. And I mean, you've got storms of this life, wind, everything coming against you in the natural. It may look like instead of accomplishing God's will, you're going to drown. You are going to die in an attempt. Uh, most of us have probably been in situations like that. And again, I say, if you haven't ever been in something where you've gotten in over your head, it's probably because you're playing it too safe. In verse 25, it says, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Now, let me turn back over to Mark chapter 6 and read some of this out of Mark chapter 6. I especially like the way it says it here. In Mark chapter 6 and in verse... 48, 
It says that he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. Now, I like this. Jesus was up praying on a mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee. He saw this storm. He was in the same storm, so he knew what was going on. It's not like he was indifferent to their needs. He knew exactly what they were going through because he was going through it also. And so he was 100% conscious of their problem. And it says that the reason he came down and started walking on the water was so that he could come down and rescue his disciples. He came down there to help them. But it said he made as though or he would have passed by them. In other words, the Lord came to their rescue. He presented himself, appeared unto his disciples, got close enough that they could see him, but he would have passed by them. Now think about this. You know that he was coming to help them. And yet he didn't just run out there screaming and yelling and waving his arms and saying, guys, don't panic. Here I come. Here I am to save the day. No, instead, he revealed himself to them. But you know what? They had to reach out by faith. They had to call out to him. They had to make a demand. They had to appropriate his miraculous working power. In other words, he didn't just do it for them. He, he revealed himself unto them. He made himself available. But they had to tap in to what he had on the inside of him to be able to receive this miracle. Well, this is a perfect parallel to the way that God provides a miracle for us in our situation. Did you know that whatever you're going through, regardless of what your opposition is, I can guarantee you God knows what you're going through. The Lord is touched with those same feelings. When Saul saw the Lord on the road to Damascus, Jesus cried out unto him and he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul had never personally persecuted the physical human being body of Jesus, but rather what he was doing was persecuting the followers of Jesus. That shows you how personally he took things. He says, why have you persecuted me? When he persecuted one of Jesus' followers, he says, that if much as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And so Jesus took what his followers felt personally. So Jesus in this situation, he knew what these disciples were going through. He was going through the same storm. In your situation, the Lord knows what you're going through. He knows every feeling, every hurt. I know that at times you think, man, if nobody knows the trouble I feel, and sometimes we feel like we've got to explain it to God, and yet the Scripture says that he knows what we have need of before we ask. He's already been touched with the feeling of our infirmities. The Lord knows exactly what you're going through, and he will reveal himself to you. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. God is with you to deliver you from whatever situation you're in. But just as he appeared to these disciples and would have passed by them. Did you know that the Lord is with you, but you have to make a demand on that power? And let me say this that crying out in desperation, in pity, saying, God, don't you love me? God, where are you? Do you still exist? Do you care? That is not making a demand on God. If anything, that is tying the hands of God because you're doubting his word. You're doubting his promises that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. In this situation, if the disciples were thinking that they were going to die, they were doubting the word of God. He told them to get into the boat and go to the other side, not get into the boat and drown, trying. See, they doubted his word. They were not aware of how powerful the promise was that he had given them. And so anyway, until they cried out, he would have passed by them. We can only speculate what might have happened. I don't know. I don't know if the Lord would have somehow or another intervened without their faith and without any response on their part. I don't know, but it looks like that he would have passed by them and it's possible that they could have died. I know that some people, especially those who are into this extreme sovereignty of God type teaching where nothing can happen but what God allows and that God orchestrates everything and everything happens perfectly according to his plan, 
Those people who believe that way just really get upset with what I'm saying here. But I tell you, that is wrong. The scripture reveals that God wills above all else that we prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers, 3 John uh, chapter 1, verse 2, and yet people die all of the time. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And yet Jesus said that there would be more people perish by the broad gate unto destruction than by the narrow gate unto everlasting life. God's will does not automatically come to pass. What God wants and what God wills can be thwarted. Now, I don't believe that his overall plan can because God is so wise, so awesome that if Satan blocks him one way, he will find some other person. He will eventually get his will accomplished. God is going to win. I have zero doubt about that. But I'm saying that on an individual basis, people die that the Lord did not want to die. People refuse to get healed or don't receive their healing, that it was God's will for them to be healed. Things don't just automatically come to pass. It is not God's will for all the wars, all the heartache, all of the tragedy, all of the divorce, all of these things. It is not God who makes these things happen. So my point is that, you know what, it's possible that Jesus would have just passed on by. He would have revealed himself. He was there to help. His power was available. But if the disciples hadn't have responded in a positive way, called out to him somehow or another, drawn on his ability, it's possible that he would have walked right on and they could have drowned. Now, I don't know that that would have happened again. You know, he might have intervened some other way. Who knows what would have happened? But I think that that's possible. I really do. And I believe that there's possibly people listening to this tape who are in a crisis situation and you need God to do something. You may be pleading and begging, but you know what? If you don't reach out in faith, if there doesn't, if something doesn't quicken on the inside of you, hopefully through this tape, and if it doesn't cause you to stand up on the inside and go to believing God, you might die. You might fail. It's not automatic that you're going to automatically win. That's just not true. And so he made as though he would have passed by it. But it says in verse 49, this is Mark chapter 6, verse 49, when they saw him walking on the seas, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. In other words, they just could not believe that Jesus was walking on top of the very thing that was about to destroy them. I mean, Jesus was so cool. Jesus was so in control. This is another thing that causes us to miss the Lord and not draw on his abilities because when we get overwhelmed, like they were overwhelmed by this storm, it's just unbelievable that the very thing that's destroying them is is nothing to God, that he can walk on top of the very problem that's about to drown them. And many times we are looking for the Lord to be as upset and wringing his hands and saying, this really is a big problem. And yet that's never going to be the response of the Lord. I've actually ministered to people before who were expressing about how terrible their situation was and said, oh, man, we've got to pray. We've got to get bunches of people together to pray. We've got to have two, three, four hundred people on a prayer chain because this is a big deal. I mean, if if. If God provides this miracle, all of the lights in heaven are liable to dim. I'm not sure that God can actually pull this off. Now, they probably wouldn't say it in that terminology, but you know what? There's people that express that same thing. They think that God is wringing his hands over this, and this really is a big problem. I want you to know that just as Jesus was walking on top of the water, The very thing that was just overwhelming them, no problem to Jesus. Whatever your problem is, whatever my problem is, no problem to Jesus. It's not a big deal. The only thing that makes it a big deal is our unbelief. The fact that we magnify how terrible our situation is. But you know what? It it would do you good to just look at things from God's perspective and realize it's not a big deal. It's no big deal. Man, Jesus was walking on top of the very thing that was destroying them. And when they saw it, they supposed it had been a spirit. In other words, they just could not believe that this wasn't bothering God. They couldn't believe that he wasn't struggling the way that they were struggling. They couldn't believe. They thought, surely it must be some kind of a vision. It couldn't be real. 
Jesus couldn't walk on top of water. That's not normal. It's not natural. Again, this is so obvious. It ought to go without saying. But you know what? God is not limited the way that we are in the physical realm. And yet, many times, we really do think God is limited. I've had people come to me before and say, have you ever heard of anybody ever being healed of AIDS? I've heard that cancer's been healed in this, but have you ever heard of somebody being healed of AIDS? Like, you know, AIDS is somehow or another worse than anything else and that they aren't sure that God can handle that. There is nothing, there is nothing impossible to God. Nothing is impossible with God. But you know what? Many times we really do get to thinking, man, a million dollars, five million dollars, a house payment, a car payment or whatever. This is just too big even for God. And we're expecting God to feel like, hey, I just can't I can't pull this off in the amount of time. I need more time to do it. God's not like that. God's able to walk on top of anything that's about to destroy you. And you need to you need to get used to God being supernatural. Man, I don't know how to express that accurately. I know that I struggle with this exact same thing. Sometimes you get to where you live in the natural so much that it just seems like, God, is there really a way out of this? There's always a way out of it. Nothing is too difficult for God. And it would just bless you. It would increase your faith tremendously if you, in your middle of your situation, would just get to relating to like these disciples that were, looks like they were going to drown, and yet Jesus is just walking on top of the problem. You know, whatever your problem is, Jesus is on top of it. He's not under it. He's not sinking. He's on top of it. It's not a problem with Jesus. And so it says in verse 50 that they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. You know, again, this this just shows how completely in control God is. The things that are bothering you and me are not bothering God. And if we would appropriate what is ours in Christ, then you don't need to be bothered. You really don't. He says, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. He was talking to people who were about to drown. I mean, they were up to their neck in water. These were men who were sailors. These were not men who were easily frightened. It wasn't just because they had gotten afraid and they were fearful over something that wasn't a serious situation. This was a crisis situation. And in the midst of this crisis situation, it looked like they were about to drown. And Jesus is telling them, be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. (laughs) It's me. You know what? You may be in a situation to where you just think that, man, there is no way that you can really rejoice until you see absolute deliverance. But you know, in the midst of it, you can get to a place to where you're just of good cheer. I know that there's people listening to me right now who are saying, well, you just haven't been where I've been. Well, it's true that I haven't been in your identical situation, but the Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that there is no situation taking you but such as is common to man. If you think that your situation is unique, if you are exempting yourself from the encouragement that I'm trying to give right now because you say my situation is worse than yours, well, then you've exempted yourself from the answers, from the truth of this. And that's not true. There is no situation taking you, but such as is common to man. I have the same things. It's just wrapped in a different package. It's got a different wrapper, a different bow on it. But you know what? I've proven in my life, that you can rejoice when there is not any reason in the natural to rejoice. That you can just use faith as the only reason for it. No rationale, nothing, no proof, no evidence of anything except your faith. You know, there was a time on, uh, I think it was March the 4th, 2001, my wife and I had just gotten back in on the 3rd from a trip out of country we we didn't go to bed until like 12 o'clock at 4.15 in the morning. I got a call from my oldest son saying, Dad, I'm sorry to tell you this, but Peter, my youngest son, is dead. And anyway, it's a long story, but I asked what happened. He told me, and I said, don't you let anybody touch him till I get there. I said, the first report is not the last report. 
Then I hung up. I told my wife. We prayed. We commanded life back into Peter. And we had to get up and get dressed. It took about an hour and 15 minutes to get into Colorado Springs from our house. And when we got there, my oldest son met me. And before I tell you what happened, on the way in, I didn't know what was going to happen. Now, I had prayed and spoken and believed God for a miracle. I knew that uh, God had more for my younger son than what he had experienced. He wasn't living in the fullness of God. And so I knew that there was more, but at the same time, you know what? There are things that you can do to short-circuit the plan of God. And um, anyway, I didn't know what was going to happen. After my wife and I prayed, we didn't say very much because we didn't want to speak forth our unbelief for doubt. But finally, I just couldn't stand it any longer. As I was driving in, I just started saying, God, you're a good God. I started cheering myself up, just like the Lord said here, be of good cheer. These guys were drowned, and yet he's telling them to be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. And I started speaking against my fear, and I started saying, Father, you're a good God. And I want you to know that whether Peter lives or not, that you are a good God. You did not do this. You didn't cause it. And I just got to praising him. And as I did, I started remembering prophecies that the Lord had given me about my children, things that hadn't happened yet. And as I got to thinking about that, you know, the Bible says you can war a good warfare by the prophecies that have gone before. And I got to thinking about, Father, if you prophesied this, well, then he has to live. And so I just got to praising God. And you can ask my wife, by the time we got into Colorado Springs, I was excited I was happy. I was praising God. I was expecting something wonderful to happen. My son had been dead for five hours by the time I got there. He had already turned black. And yet when I walked in, my oldest son said, Dad, within five minutes, ten minutes after I called you, Peter just sat up. They already had a toe tag on him. He was stripped naked, put over on the side. They had already pronounced him as gone. It's a long story anyway. I talked to the nurse. I asked him twice if Peter was actually dead. And he says, nobody comes in here like that and leaves alive. And I said, so was he dead? And he says, if this ever happens again, he will leave in a body bag. So who knows? I don't know. I'm not, you know, I hadn't got a medical certificate to prove that he was dead, but he had already turned black. He hadn't breathed for five hours. And uh, anyway, I believe God raised him from the dead. But what I'm saying is, before I saw that situation resolved, I was praising God, and I was of good cheer. And I know that some of you, are, when when the Lord here told these men, they were, you know, the storm was still raging, the boat was still full, it looked like they were still drowning, everything was still at its worst, and he says, be of good cheer, don't be afraid. Most people can't be of good cheer until they see the physical problems resolved. And then when everything works out, they're going to be of good cheer. But, you know, one of the great truths of faith is that you have to be of good cheer and resist that fear and get into faith when the storm is still raging. And then after is when you see the miracle. Anybody could be of good cheer. Anybody could overcome fear once the storm stops, once the boat is translated to the other side. But you know what? It's faith that causes a person to rejoice while the storm is still raging, before they know what the outcome is going to be. Jesus told them in the midst of the storm, before they were delivered, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Man, that's awesome. I tell you, if you got just nothing but this little point right here, this is enough to make you shout. This is enough to make you stand up on the inside. And if you stood up on the inside, then eventually you would stand up on the outside. You would see your physical circumstances change. I was talking to a man at church this morning who I've been praying with about healing. And he's seen some improvement in his physical body. But the main thing is that he's just been discouraged and he's been hurt in his attitude, in his emotions. And he's finally seen that. He told me he's been listening to my tapes over and over. And the pastor the morning, this morning I was at church, it was awesome what he was saying. 
And he says, you know, I really believe that if I can ever get myself encouraged and stand up on the inside, then I'll stand up on the outside. And I said, that's it. And he's getting a glimpse of it. He's not there yet, but now he sees it. He's pressing in that direction. And I firmly believe it's just going to be a matter of time until he will see the physical manifestation because he's beginning to be of good cheer. He's overcoming fear while the storm is still raging. Once you do that, once you've got calm on the inside, it will be calm on the outside eventually. Once you get your answer manifest in your heart, it will manifest itself in the physical realm. Jesus told them here, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid, which most people today, if a minister was to stand up to a person in a crisis situation, say, for instance, they've got cancer, the doctor told them you're going to die, and you tell them, don't be afraid, be of good cheer. Man, praise God right now for your healing. Did you know that most people would criticize a minister for that and saying, man, here you are speaking faith and you don't understand the pain that this person's going through and you aren't empathizing with them. You show no sympathy whatsoever. The traditional approach of dealing with problems in the church today is to get down and wallow and cry and be as discouraged and defeated and say, oh, man, you are absolutely justified in being angry, bitter, hurt. I know these feelings. That's the approach that the church is doing is basically just sympathizing with people. Now, again, I'm not saying that we are insensitive to people. I'm not saying that you sit there and, and don't acknowledge that a person is struggling. But, man, we've got to give them something beyond that. We've got to do like Jesus did. Most people today would say Jesus was insensitive. And how could a person tell people who are up to their neck in water and about to drown, be of good courage? It is I. Be not afraid. Man, that is just unreasonable. Uh, Jesus was a faith person. That's no doubt about it. And people would criticize him for it. I tell you what, we need more of that. We really do. You know, there was an instance where a woman it was in our church, and she was a young lady. She had just gotten married, and she went around telling everybody she wanted a dozen kids. Some people questioned the wisdom of that, but nonetheless, that was her choice. That's what she wanted. And so she told everybody she just couldn't wait to get pregnant and have children. Anyway, her husband was a minister. They were out on the road up to six months at a time. And one time while she was gone, the word came back that she was pregnant. Everybody got excited and went to rejoicing because they knew how much she wanted children. When she got back, she went to the doctor and found out it was a tubular pregnancy. And uh, then instead of her having children, the doctor said if he didn't remove all of her female organs, through an operation, that she would be dead in a week. And, of course, if she did live, that she only had a 50-50 chance of living, and if she did live, she'd never be able to have children. So, I mean, it was a bleak prognosis. Even at the very best, her number one goal of being a mother of 12 children looked out of reach. I'd heard about this. Somebody had told me, but, um, you know, I... Anyway, I was talking to someone. We were laughing and cutting up, and it was at a Wednesday night service. And uh, this lady came up and tapped me on the shoulder, and I turned around. I'd just been laughing and telling jokes with someone, and she was crying. Tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around, and she said, Andrew, have they told you what happened to me? And you know what? I just couldn't turn off my joy. I just couldn't turn off my excitement and things because of her situation. And anyway, I looked right at her, and I said, Cancer is no problem with God. I said, you act like this is a big deal. It's not a big deal. And it's just like I slapped her in the face. And she stopped and looked at me and she says, what are you saying? And I said, it's not any harder for God to heal cancer than it is to heal a cold. I said, you could just believe God and you don't have to go without children and you don't have to die in a week's time. Anyway, she asked if I'd come over and talk to her and her husband. My wife and I did. And I just told them, basically, I said, it's only a big thing because you've made it a big thing. It's not hard for God. It, it's not like this is going to make the lights in heaven dim if you ask God to heal you. And uh, she said, so should we continue to go to the doctor? What about the doctor? Should we take the surgery? And I said, well, it's up to you. It's uh, your choice. I said, it's not sin 
if you do it. But I said, I tell you what, if they take out all your female organs, you aren't going to have any children. There was only one virgin birth, and you aren't going to have another one. I said, that's not the way that it works. I said, if it was me, I'd just believe God. And she said, but they told me I'd be dead in a week. And I said, well, I said, if you believe that, then you need to let them do the operation. And there's nothing wrong with that. If that's where your faith is, go for it. But I said, uh, you can believe God, and it's not a problem. And anyway, this girl chose to believe God. It's a long story, but that's been probably 15 years ago. And she's had at least four or five children. I've lost count. I, she moved. and But anyway, she lived. She's had all of these children, natural childbirth, because anybody who saw her doctor records wouldn't uh, believe her situation, wouldn't allow a normal delivery. So she's just had them at home. And you know what? It's not a problem. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to show compassion towards people who are hurting and understand, but we've got, you, you got to go beyond that. And we've got to show faith and we've got to show encouragement to people. Jesus, it wouldn't have done any good if he had come out there and he says, guys, oh, it's terrible. I can't believe what's happening to you. This is really big. This is terrible. And if he would have gone to expressing unbelief, he was the only hope they had. If Jesus would have got out there to magnified the problem and talked about how bad it was, they would have been in big time trouble. You know what? Jesus needed to minimize the situation and magnify God instead and show that God is so much greater than this. And he did that by walking on top of the very thing that was destroying them. He did that by telling them, hey, guys, don't be afraid. Be of good cheer. You ought to be happy. You are about to see one awesome miracle. Do you know, really, when you get to operating in faith, it does get to a place to where once your faith is quickened and once you're walking in faith, it gets you juiced. It gets you excited because you say, God, this is going to be one awesome miracle. When I was talking about driving into the springs and had been given this report about my son having died after I got to speaking my faith and praising God, and all of a sudden faith rose up and I began to be excited. Did you know that was part of what I was thinking about God? This is going to be some awesome miracle. He's been dead for five hours. He'd already turned black. And man, this is going to be an awesome miracle. And it was. What a great thing. What an awesome miracle. Whether you say he was raised from the dead or whether he was comatose or who knows. He was gone. He, he turned black. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. And you know what? It's an awesome miracle. And I actually got excited about it. These disciples, that's what Jesus was telling them. Be of good cheer. And you you know, they could have really been excited. They said, Jesus told us to go to the other side, not to drown. And yet there is no way in the natural we're getting to the other side. The boat's already full. It's going down. This is going to be something awesome. As I said, in the sixth chapter of the book of John, it reveals that they were just translated to the other side of the lake, approximately two miles, just boom, zipped over there, and instantly the storm was over and there was a great calm. You know, most of us would be thrilled to say, man, that is awesome. Wouldn't it have been wonderful to be there? Well, in a sense, that's what Jesus is saying. It hadn't happened yet. They were still in the midst of the storm, but Jesus knew that they weren't going to drown in the middle of this lake. He knew that he was going to work out, and so he was telling them, guys, rejoice. Hey, you ought to watch this. You are about to experience one awesome demonstration of my power. Do you know you can actually get to that place? I know that what I'm saying is just totally, totally, totally off the wall to many, many people. You live so much in the natural that you don't ever, ever, get to a place to where you rejoice in the midst of a trying situation. Now, some people have heard enough teaching on this that they may rejoice through gritted teeth. They're doing it not not from a genuine heart, but they're doing it as warfare. They're doing it trying to obtain victory and stuff. And that's okay. There's a time and a place that you have to do it that way. But you know what? After a while, you can get to where you see so many victories of the Lord that you are not just rejoicing through gritted teeth. It's not something you're forcing yourself to do. But you know what? You can actually get to the place where you are really rejoicing, where you are rejoicing 
out of a genuine heart because you just know that something awesome is going to come out of it. That's the way that Paul and Silas were in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. You remember they were thrown in the Philippian jail? And you can prove that they didn't just sing praises at midnight and pray so that they could be delivered. That wasn't why they were doing it. Because when the deliverance came, the Lord sent an earthquake and all of the prison doors were open and every man's shackles fell off of them. When that happened, Paul and Silas didn't leave. They weren't just praising God to get deliverance. If that had been their motive, they'd have been gone as soon as the deliverance came. But here's a radical thought. They were actually praising God out of a pure heart. They were excited. They were excited just praising God for who he was. They had actually moved into a place just like Jesus is saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. They were rejoicing in their relationship with God. They knew God was going to take care of things, and they just rejoiced when deliverance came. They didn't even take it. They stayed in jail. And not only Paul and Silas, but every one of those unsaved, ungodly prisoners, every one of them stayed there. Man, there was a powerful manifestation of the presence of God to keep these ungodly people in their prison cells after they had been loosed. You know what I'm saying is you can get to a place to where instead of what I'm saying about being of good cheer and don't be afraid Even when the storm is still raging, you can get to a place where that's not something you're just trying to accomplish. It's something that you really have. You can have good cheer, even in the midst of it. The doctor can tell you you're going to die, and you just go to praising God and saying, Father, this is awesome, awesome. You know what? If I go to be with you, well, that's wonderful. I mean, we sing these songs when we all get to heaven. Then the doctor tells you you're going there and you start crying. (laughs) Makes you think you didn't really mean it when you were singing that song. If you think about it properly, if you die, you go to be with the Lord. And if you receive your healing, which Jesus has already granted it, but if you can receive it, well, then what an awesome testimony. Either way, you can't lose for winning. If you get your healing manifest, it becomes a great testimony. Man, you can start thinking about this could open up my entire ministry. I could travel the world telling about how awesome God is for this healing. And if you don't see the healing manifest, you get to go be with God. And that's pretty good, too. You know what? You could be of good cheer regardless of what your situation is. I've belabored that point. I've stayed on it longer than what I intended to. But you know what? Really, it's this important. If you don't, first of all, exhibit faith while the storm is still going, you won't see the deliverance. There are many people that are going through the motions, praising God, saying some of the right things, but they are just wishing and hoping that it's going to work. They aren't really believing. When you really start believing, then you'll find out that your faith will start having thanksgiving in it. You'll start rejoicing and abounding in faith with thanksgiving. Look at this scripture in Colossians in chapter 2. And in verse uh, 6, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. In verse 7, Rooted and built up in him, and established in the truth as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Abounding therein what? In faith. With thanksgiving. Do you know the way that faith abounds is through thanksgiving? If you don't, have a thankful heart. If you aren't like Jesus is saying, being of good cheer in the midst of your storm, then you know what? You may have faith, but your faith isn't abounding. Your faith isn't overcoming. It's not greater than your fears. When you really get into a God kind of faith, you'll find out that you can persist to a point that there is actually excitement. There is actually joy. And I'm not talking about Uh, something that you manufacture and make out of yourself, it's coming from God. It's a calm assurance, a peace, a joy that comes through knowing that God is a faithful God and he's never forsaken you and he never will. And you can calm yourself with that. Do you know, before the Lord performed the miracle that these disciples needed, he first of all told them to believe him, basically trust him. Trust me and be of good cheer. It's I, it's me. Don't be afraid. 
You don't do you remember who I am? I'm the one that just fed 5,000 men, maybe 10,000, 20,000 people total and miraculously multiplied it. I'm the one that's already seen people raised from the dead, blind eyes open, deaf ears open. It's me. Don't you realize who you are serving? Don't you realize who's with you? It's me. And if you recognize who Jesus is on the inside of you, then you know what? You need to be of good courage and you need to not be afraid. Boy, those are powerful, powerful truths. That's awesome. And I want to encourage you before we go any further, before we talk about how to walk on the water. Do you know every one of these things that we've talked about is essential? You first of all need to reckon, you need to have a word from God. These disciples had a command from God. They didn't embark out on this sea on their own. It wasn't their will to go across there. As a matter of fact, if you would go back into the um, 22nd verse of Matthew chapter 14, it says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship. Did you know that the word constrain means that he had to use some force? I don't believe he physically forced them, like grabbing their arm and putting them in the boat. But they ex- they expressed some type of resistance towards getting in this boat. And he constrained them, probably with his words, and just told them, no, uh, you get in. Now, why did they resist? Why was there resistance? Why did he have to constrain them? Well, it doesn't say. But I believe that the reason is because these men were fishermen. And they had all grown up being fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is famous for having storms come down over Mount Hermon, over these mountains that are to the north and to the east of the Sea of Galilee. And they would kind of hide the storms. And then when they would crest those mountains, they would, I mean, rush down on that sea and they would come quick, quickly. And because of this, you had to be really uh, in tune with what the weather was like. Some people listening to this tape will not understand this because the way we discern what the weather is like is by listening to a weatherman. We have virtually no uh, acclimation to that whatsoever. But I remember when I pastored my first little group of ranchers in Pritchett, Colorado, they would start talking about, well, it's going to rain tonight. And I'd think, well, did you hear that on the weather report? And they'd say, no, they could tell. They could feel the barometric pressure changing. They could feel the humidity in the air. And sure enough, it would be exactly the way they'd say. They'd say, boy, the wind is coming out of the north, and that means we're going to have a northerner come in. And they would predict they were much better at the weather than the weatherman was. And you know what? After being around them for just a short period of time, I got to where I began to start picking up. I could tell when it was going to be a a winter storm coming in. Well, these disciples were, I believe, probably even more in tune with the weather situation than what we see in, in people today. And I think that this is the reason Jesus had to constrain them. In other words, the storm may not have hit yet, but they could see it coming. All of the signs were there. It was against their better judgment to be out on the Sea of Galilee. And yet they went because Jesus told them to. Now, this is significant. They had a word from God. They had voiced their disbelief, or you could say their reservations about it. And yet the Lord, knowing full well what they were feeling, said, Nope, you go to the other side. It will work. They had a word from God. So they were there in the center of God's will. They may have been struggling. They were having problems. They were having to fight for their life. But nonetheless, they were in the center of God's will. Now, it's important in your situation that you know that the adversity you're suffering is not from your own ignorance, from your own disobedience. Like, for instance, Jonah, he ran from God instead of following God's instructions, and he got into a storm. And uh, that storm just about cost him his life, but that storm was totally out of God's will. That was something that he never had to experience. You need to be honest enough to evaluate where you are. Is the situation you're in, this storm, the struggle that you're into, is it coming because of your own rebellion at God? Did you or did you not have a word from God? Did you or did you not hear from God? These disciples had a word from God, and that didn't mean that they didn't have a problem. They were in a storm, a life-threatening storm, but they were perfectly in the center of God's will. The 16th chapter of the book of Acts, again, uh, 
Paul and Silas saw a vision and were told to go over into Macedonia and help this man. And they went there. And yet within just days of being in Philippi, they were thrown into the Philippian jail. Following God does not mean that you are going to be stormless, jail-less, problem-less. That's not true. Many people teach that, that if it's really God's will, everything will just work perfectly. And yet Paul said there's a great and an effectual door opened unto us, and there are many adversaries. God led Paul into Philippi, and yet he was thrown in jail in a short period of time. Just because you're in a storm, just because it looks like you're about to drown, does not mean that you've missed God. Don't let circumstances tell you God's will. Did you have a word from God or not? If you've got a word from God, then stand on that word and be of good cheer, because God's with you. Don't be afraid. Exhibit faith before you see the final outcome. That's what faith is. Begin to start rejoicing and operating in praise before the battle is won, before the outcome is over with. Anybody can rejoice after everything is taken care of. But a Bible principle is that you've got to operate in faith before you see the physical manifestation of God. And regardless of what your problem is, The Lord is there with you. He knows your situation just as surely as Jesus knew the circumstances that these disciples were in. He came out there to help them, but he would have passed by if they didn't call out to him. You need to call out to God. Don't just sit there and let your storm rage and you sit there in silence. Call out to God. Don't call out in unbelief. Don't call out in just frustration or anger or bitterness, but in faith. Call out. Make a demand. Draw on the power of God that is available to you. And to express your faith, be of good courage. Don't be afraid. Remember who it is that you are serving. And you know what? If you will do those things, that's laying the groundwork for the miracle that God is going to provide. Now, in this first tape, I didn't get very far into this. All I've done is lay the foundation. But on our our next tape, we're going to talk about how you can literally get out of the boat and walk on the water. And I tell you, I think that this is going to be a huge help to you. So I want to encourage you that if you are in a storm right now, take courage by the things that we've talked about on this tape. Start believing God. Make sure that you've heard from God. Make sure that you are in the center of God's will. And call out to God in faith. Make a demand. Man, begin to start believing God. Start rejoicing, being of good cheer, even before you see the storm stilled. And if you will do that, you can literally reach a place to where you are enjoying the supply of God. Faith is your evidence. You are in faith, and you are having such a good time in faith that really whether your circumstance works out or not is not the issue. You are believing God, and you've got the proof. You want it to work out as much for other people's benefit as you do for yours, just so that it can be a great testimony. Praise God. God loves you. God wants you to be a water walker. He wants you to overcome the storms instead of to be overcome by the storms. And I believe that this series is going to help you do just that.